Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. This evening, we are going to be going through Hebrews 11, and this is a very famous chapter known as the Hall of Fame of Faith. I'm sure that you are all familiar with it. You've probably read it a number of times in the past. I will be moving somewhat quicker through Hebrews 11 than you have been accustomed to so far in this class, and that's not because I don't think Hebrews 11 is significant or that it has a wealth of knowledge. It's merely that you're probably more familiar with Hebrews 11 than the rest of the book. And these are, it's essentially a rehashing of stories that we're already familiar with. And so we will be digging into Hebrews 11 a little bit, but we're going to be picking up the pace somewhat because I have three chapters left and only two weeks left. So we'll be moving a little bit quicker through Hebrews 11, slow it down just a bit when we get to Hebrews 12. And we'll see if we can get through all of Hebrews 12 tonight. I don't know that we will. Uh, but if not, we'll finish up uh, regardless next week. And uh, it has been a pleasure teaching you. So uh, the fact that we're down to just the last two classes is a, a little bit bittersweet. But we'll go ahead and dive into the scripture right now. Start in Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. For by it the people of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the world has been created by the word of God, so that what is seen has not been made out of things that are visible. Now, when we look at the first verse, this is something that has often been referred to as a definition, a biblical definition of faith. Uh, but we should keep in mind that while this is a definition of faith, I don't think that this is meant to be exhaustive. So while this certainly points out specific aspects of faith, that it is the certainty of things hoped for and the proof or the evidence of things not seen, a couple important things that we can draw from that. First of all, the word there, proof, that is used is actually one that is specifically used in the Greek in a legal sense. And so the Greek word that is used there means proof or evidence. In, in other words, if the story of the gospel were being put on trial and you had a legal proceeding to decide whether or not the things that the gospel claims are in fact true, it would say that faith is part of the evidence that you would present in that. In other words, the religion which it spawned would be part of the proof that the gospel really happened. And that may seem, especially from our modern, very scientific lens, a little bit circular and a little bit illogical, but actually if you think about it, it does make sense. It made sense back then and it makes sense now. One of the greatest historical proofs that the gospel existed is that you look at the martyrs in the first century, which is something that this book deals somewhat indirectly with. And so with that idea, you had people that were there that were eyewitnesses that actually saw Jesus, that talked to him, that knew him. And these things were all done in public. It's not like some of the other world religions. I'm actually just started a class uh, in, in my graduate program on Islam. And whenever the angel speaks to Muhammad, it's always done in private. It's just him and the angel Gabriel, and he's relaying God's words to Muhammad according to the Quran. But it's interesting that in Christianity, that's not something that happens. Jesus comes down, he speaks publicly, he's there, he's in the temple teaching daily, and all these people see him. And then when he dies and is resurrected, multiple people see him on several different occasions to attest to the fact that he was raised from the dead. And these people would not have gone to their death willingly for something that they knew for a fact was a lie. And so the faith that they had actually is an evidence and a proof that the things that are being espoused by the Hebrew writer are indeed a part of the proof that we would have if we were to put the gospel on trial. And then in verse 3, where it talks about uh, faith, um, and, and by faith we, we understand the world. Faith is something that is learned through experience. And that's something that the Bible espouses over and over again, going back to the Old Testament, which we'll be looking at uh, here in just the next few verses. It's essentially reason combined with revelation. Revelation. 
Because there is divine revelation given to characters in the Old Testament that we're going to see over and over again. But the thing that is consistent is not just that there was revelation given to them, but there were also promises that were kept. That God said things would happen and then they happened. And this built a faith within the people that were faithful to him. And so you can go with that all the way back from Genesis all the way up into the Gospels. Uh, we're going to be looking at those stories over and over and over again, that when God says something is going to happen, He means it. And because of that, that builds and instills a faith in people that listen to Him and take heed of His words. And so that's really a primary theme of the gospel, uh, of, of the gospel and of the book of Hebrews that we're going to see in this Hall of Fame of Faith with the different characters that we go through. So let's go ahead and move to uh, verses 4 through 7. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he was attested to be righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For before he was taken up, he was attested to have been pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith." So we see this from verse 6 especially where it's talking about without faith it's impossible to please him. That faith in God is not merely belief. See, sometimes I think people in, in the religious setting, Christians broadly, they use faith and belief interchangeably as though they're the same thing. They're synonyms. Uh, you could take faith out of this sentence and put uh, belief in and it means exactly the same thing. But the Bible never espouses that. That's something that is not a biblical definition of faith. So when we're talking about how the Bible defines faith, we can see over and over again in the Scripture, and this is just one instance of it, that when the Bible defines faith, it is talking about faithfulness to the revelation. So there's revelation, and that revelation can instill belief, but then for that belief to, to become faith, it must include a faithfulness, it must include an action, obedience that follows that. Now, we see this from James, and we won't go to it tonight, but in James it says, you believe in God, you do well, but the devils also believe in God. So this idea that belief and faith are interchangeable and they're the same thing, that's simply never something that the Bible ever claims. Belief in God is, of course, important. You have to get to that point before you can believe anything else that he says. But the point is, you don't have faith merely because you believe. Faith is belief coupled with obedience. And another thing that's important to bring up here, where it talks about uh, Abel and then Abraham and, and Noah, um, who is God is an important question, and that kind of goes back to belief. But it's really a better question than the idea of does God exist? Because you can look all throughout history. The pagans, for example, throughout the stories in, in Israel, they believed that God was real. I don't remember any instance where any of the pagans that were being dealt with with the Gentile nations ever said, no, no, the Israelite God, he's not real. They all believed God was real, every single one of them. But they also believed their gods were real, and they believed that their gods were just as good as the Israelites' gods, in many cases better. And so really the question of who is God, what is his character, what is his nature, what is he like, that is a far better question than the question of does God exist. I'm not saying that that's not an important question, but we'll see over and over again through the, the 11th chapter of Hebrews that these are people that ask the question of who is God and came up with the correct answer both through divine revelation and by an exercise of their faith, being obedient, God keeping his promises, and that building their faith as they continued to go on. Uh, it talks about Abel here. Abel was obedient. That built his faith in God. Cain believed in God too. But he didn't truly have faith because he didn't do what God asked. And so that's a contrast that it draws there. Uh, Noah had faith, and because of that he did something that he had not seen happen yet. And of course, God did exactly what he said he was going to do with flooding the earth. And then that faith 
was rewarded in his family's salvation. And so this is a theme that we're going to see in Hebrews as well, this idea of faith being a question of who is God? What is his nature? What is his character? Does he deserve our perfect allegiance? Is he himself a perfect being? Does it mean that when he says something, it's absolutely going to happen? And these are people that answer those questions correctly. Let's, oh, sorry, go ahead. That's true. So that's, that's a contrast that is brought up in this verse, right? That um, faith is not mentioned in Cain's sacrifice, but it is mentioned in Abel's sacrifice. And so it, it, there, sorry, go ahead. Right, he believed in God. In fact, he even believed in God enough to say, I need to offer something, but he didn't offer what God asked for. And so even a failure in obedience, even if there's some measure of obedience, is not truly faith because it is not adherence to what God has said. Excellent point. Uh, So let's go ahead and read verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, going to a place with which he was to receive for an inheritance, And he left, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as a stranger in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, even from one man, and one who was as good as dead at that, there was born descendants who were just as the stars of the heaven in number, and as the innumerable grains of sand along the seashore. This would have been particularly important to a Jewish Christian living in this time for some of the reasons that we've already discussed in this class. Abraham is the pilgrim. He's the trailblazer. He is the founder of the faith. Sure, Moses brought the law, but that law is a continuation and a manifestation of the faith that Abraham had in the one true God. And so this idea, what we know about the audience, is that they were people that were Jewish Christians scattered abroad. They felt like they didn't have a home. They felt like they did not have a place to belong. They felt like they were outcasts of society. And that's exactly who Abraham was. And so this symbolism of Abraham would have been particularly strong with the Hebrew audience because A, Abraham is somebody they deeply reverence and should, but B, because they're kind of in the same spiritual situation. Now, they may not be pilgrims in the sense that they're constantly wandering around the way that Abraham did, but in the spiritual sense, that's exactly where they are. They are in a place that does not share their faith, that does not share their values, whether they're living in a largely Greek city or whether they're living in the heart of Jerusalem. Either way, they are the minority and they are being persecuted. And Abraham, with the exception of Melchizedek, which we looked at earlier in this class, he's pretty much the only person that believes in God that he ever encounters outside of his own family. And so this is the same kind of thing that is going on with the Hebrew Christians is they feel like they're kind of on an island. And so the symbolism of Abraham would have been particularly strong with them. Let's go ahead and look at uh, verses 13 through 16. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For those who say such things make clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country which they left, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. There is a certain aspect of faith, the Christian faith in particular, that is an exercise in venturing into the unknown. That is what it means to have faith, is you have situations that you're going to have that arise in your life that you have to just take it on God's word that He's going to take care of you. That's part of faith. Now, that takes many, many different forms, and no two situations are exactly the same. But the point is, this idea of faith comes with it, this idea that you are going to be venturing into a strange land, and that's especially true with a common theme sort of at the heart of all Christianity. That's the reason the Gospel of Matthew, for example, hits so hard on this idea of a kingdom, is because you are being made more aware of the fact that Christians are a 
a minority, a subgroup within the world. And this is something that Jesus talks about over and over again. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so we'll see that many, many times espoused not only in Hebrews, but also in the gospel, the Pauline epistles, many, many other places. So what ultimately is the fulfillment of Christian faith? Well, many thought he is going to come back. This is the thing that he left them with uh, right before Pentecost. It's the thing that he left them with at the end of, for example, the Gospel of Luke. This promise that he is going to return, and when he returns, I'm coming back for you. When that return happens, he is going to call his people to him. That's something that is both reminiscent of the way that God calls his people out of exile in the Old Testament, uh, the way that he calls them out of Egypt and the Exodus. But ultimately, that is what is going to happen with us and with Jesus. That's the ultimate fulfillment of why Jesus came to earth to reclaim his lost people. And because of that, many of the Christians that were being addressed here, they weren't given a timetable on that. So many of them, and we see this throughout secular history, and there's hints of it also in, in the New Testament documents as well, they thought that that return was going to be like a couple of years. They really thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. And that's not a ridiculous idea, but it's one that they shouldn't have been expecting so quickly. And because of that, there were a lot of people, not just in Hebrews, but in other New Testament writings, this is being addressed, that there were people that were a little bit discouraged. The Thessalonians, for example, uh, were one of the churches that specifically Paul wrote to and said, you guys were anticipating that Jesus was coming back very quickly, and it, that's not necessarily something that he guaranteed. And so don't just live as though at any moment now um, you're going to be taken up. You, you actually have to go out and do work, and you remember that was a problem that they had, is that they were kind of, well, Jesus is coming back, so there's no point in me working or, or being diligent in my job because Jesus is going to come back for us pretty soon anyway. And, and Paul is telling them that's not the correct way to live. And so there were probably quite a few Jewish Christians that converted to Christianity thinking Jesus is going to be coming back pretty soon, and then that didn't happen. And so this encouragement in the book of Hebrews is probably specifically speaking to that as well. Um, and I love verse 15. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole book where it talks about these great giants of faith. And it says, keep in mind that they had the opportunity to turn back. You know, Abraham could have said, I've been following God for a while now, and Isaac still hasn't been born, so I'm just going to head back to my homeland and uh, just live out my life that way. He could have done that. For all we know, there were people that God called before Abraham that actually did do that. We don't know. But you have an opportunity to turn back. And so faith is not a one-time event. It is a constant thing. You have to constantly decide that you want to be obedient to God. You have to constantly, every day, make yourself and, and make this, uh, the way that Daniel would describe it, purpose in your heart that you are going to be a follower of God. And so this is what the Hebrew author is trying to drum up inside them. Just because Jesus hasn't come back yet does not mean that this is the time to start throwing in the towel. So let's go ahead and go to verses 17 through 22. By faith, Abraham... When he was tested, offered up Isaac, and the one who had received the promises was offering up his only son. It was he whom, said, whom it was said, through Isaac your descendants shall be named. He considered God, uh, considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of his, the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So you'll, you'll notice a theme here in this particular passage of Scripture. It's been true throughout the Hall of Fame of Faith that we've been looking at so far, but it's especially true here. Faith is forward-looking. That's not to say that faith can't be strengthened by looking at the past. If that were not the case, this chapter wouldn't exist. That's all this chapter is, is looking at the past and looking at examples of faith. But ultimately, faith is forward-looking. 
Abraham was looking forward to God's promises and pursued them, though they had not yet manifested. And we see that happening throughout the stories of the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Judah. There's this constant idea that there is something they are pursuing, that they are looking for being obedient to God. And there are promises that have been made to them that have not yet become fulfilled. And we know that in the, in the cases of several great heroes of the faith, there are things that they knew would be fulfilled, that God promised would be fulfilled, that they didn't even see happen in their lifetimes. You know, Moses sees the promised land from the top of a mountain and then dies. David doesn't actually get to see the temple of God built. That's something that he reserved to have done in the time of Solomon. And so sometimes the faith isn't even rewarded on this side of eternity, but that promise is made and they look forward to it. Let's look at verses 23 through 29. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that he was a beautiful child and were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he preserved as though seeing him who is unseen, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as though through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted, were drowned. There's a lot of things that could be say about, said about this passage, but really it boils down to this. If you have faith in God, you have more faith in God than you do the powers of this world. And that's something that is evident throughout the Exodus story that is being discussed here, that Moses, from his parents all the way down to the Red Sea, there was this attitude that I'm more afraid of what God will do to me if I'm disobedient to him than I am afraid of Pharaoh if I'm disobedient to him. And this is not something that would have been lost on an ancient person, because remember, in Egyptian mythology, Pharaoh is God. He's a god on the same status as Ra and, and uh, Amenhotep and all the other Egyptian gods. In fact, most of the Egyptian gods were past pharaohs. And so this idea that is being brought up would have been something that is very familiar to the Hebrew authors. He's saying, you guys are thinking about abandoning your faith because life is getting really hard. There's people that are persecuting you. There, there may be worldly powers that are telling you you're in the wrong what if Moses had done that? You see, the true manifestation of faith is that you care more about what God thinks of you and His opinion of you than any of the worldly consequences that might come about. And so he's encouraging them along those lines because he understands that they need some encouragement in this area because these are things that they are dealing with at the time. And so in the same way that they are going to defy the world's expectations and what the world would say they ought to do. Uh, Moses was doing the same thing then, and so he's actually looking to Old Testament heroes that they would have held in high esteem to encourage them along the same lines. And let's look at verses 30 and 31. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after the Israelites had marched around them for seven days. By faith the prostitute Rahab did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. So there's an interesting little addendum here, and it's very short, only takes up two verses, but it's significant in the sense that we've been talking about faith and the manifestation of it, but there's one thing that I think is really emphasized by this passage about Rahab, which is faith must also be rooted in truth. Lots of people have faith in things that are not true. And what they were in danger of sliding back into was something that was not true, that you can be accepted under the old law now. Even though Jesus has come, even though the, the, we, we had, saw all those arguments about God having been put to death and therefore His will is now in effect, that the old law has been put away, it has been replaced by the new. We saw all those arguments. 
this particular passage is saying to them, if you slide back into that faith, and it would be a faith, but it would be a faith in something that is no longer true. There was a time where that was the way to be seen as acceptable in God's sight, but now that time is no more. And so for faith to be acceptable to God, it also must be rooted in truth. You see, where it's talking about here with Rahab, the people of Jericho had faith in their gods. The people in Jericho had absolute faith that their deities and their armies and their giant walls were going to protect them. They bet on the wrong horse. They put their faith in something that did not deserve their faith. And if these Christians slide back into a, another form of idolatry, worshiping the law of Moses, worshiping something that does not have the power to save them, they will be in the same boat. And so there's a parallelism with their situation that, that goes with Rahab. Rahab, despite being in the minority opinion in her, her city, actually happened to be the only one that was right. And because she had faith rooted in truth, she was rewarded by God for that. So let's go ahead and move on to verses 32 through 36. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David and Samuel, of the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mocking and flogging and further chains and imprisonment. This is where the argument comes to a head in chapter 11. He's saying, you're considering renouncing your faith because of persecution, despite the fact that you know throughout all of the history of God's people, that wasn't just something that happened occasionally. It was a sign that they were on the right path. And so, by motive of this is getting really difficult, and we're not really sure if this Jesus thing is really the right path, if we really pick the right thing. He's saying, not only is your persecution not a sign that God is displeased with you, it's actually a sign that you are God's people. It is an indication that we have seen all throughout biblical history that when you are in opposition to the world, that actually is the group of people that are right. And so it's a very powerful and potent argument that the Hebrew author is making here. He's saying that we could go through any number of Bible stories. It's the people that stand against the powers that be that are actually the ones that are on the side of right. And that's something that has always been true. And so where he's talking about all these different horrible things that happened, verse 35 is... Uh, verse 35 and 36 are, are a really great testament to this. It's uh, saying that they might obtain a better resurrection. Why did all of these people, why did all these Bible characters do this? It's because they had faith in something greater. And they had faith that there was going to come a time where their persecution was not worthy to be compared with the reward that they would eventually inherit. So their persecution is actually a sign that they were on God's side, not a sign that God was displeased with them. Let's look at verses 37 through 40. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being des uh, destitute, afflicted, tormented, people of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, on mountains, and sheltering in caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval, through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. The thing that God promises is always better than what is imagined, without exception. And even though God rarely promises worldly gain, riches, longevity, 
those aren't things that God necessarily guarantees. There are occasions where God guaranteed them to one or two individuals on a specific basis. But overall, being a part of God's kingdom, being a part of God's elect, does not mean that worldly goods and, and worldly pleasures are going to be something that follows that. But God's promises are always better than what is imagined. For example, when God promises in the Old Testament that they are going to be coming to a promised land, the actual promise was going to be what happens in the resurrection when they get to be with God in person. And so uh, all of these things, and we saw earlier in Hebrews 10 that these things are a shadow of things to come. He's saying that the things that are coming, the things that have been promised to you, they're even better than the way that God describes them. And so that's an encouragement to stay on the course. And I love this line in verse 38 where it talks about people of whom the world was not worthy. And maybe the reason that I like it, I'm, I'm going to be honest, it, it may have something to do with it kind of reminds me of the last line in The Dark Knight uh, where it talks about Batman being the hero we deserve, but not the one we, uh, uh, not the hero we deserve, but the one we need. That's kind of the same idea that's being espoused in this passage, right? These are people that are greater than the hero that we probably deserved considering our own state of depravity. But they're exactly the spiritual examples that we need. And Christ is just the ultimate form of that. Because unlike all of these other heroes, Christ was actually sinless. We didn't deserve Him, but we needed Him. And so that's exactly the idea that is being espoused here, that He's going back to these Old Testament characters. And remember, He has already made the case that Jesus is superior to all of them. And we're going to see a continuation of that line of thinking here in just a second. Because the main point of all this is the world is always going to hate the righteous. It is always going to have a reason to have animosity towards God's people. But God's people, regardless of this, always endure. They always come out on top in the end. That is something that has been true throughout of human history without exception. There was a great... Uh, old program when I was a kid. I don't know if any of you remember that. It was something that James Dobson with Focus on the Family did called Adventures in Odyssey. And they were doing like this kind of sketch thing where they're doing a play-by-play -play, uh, like it was a sporting event of... Uh, I'm trying to remember which event this was. I, I want to say it was the battle with Gideon. And uh, one of the, the color commentators, and he's doing it in very sports-like lingo, he's saying, uh, giving basically God stats, which was hysterical. And uh, he essentially says, and God is undefeated and always roots for the underdog. Well, those things are true. I mean, it's a silly way to say it, but it's the truth, isn't it? That God always does more with less, and he yet still has an undefeated record. And so that's something that is kind of being put on display here for the Hebrew authors. And this is going to move into chapter 12 with this sort of lingering in their minds about what has happened and what they are aware of has happened in the Old Testament, he's saying, and the same is true now. You're going to be rewarded just as they were rewarded for following God and doing so faithfully. So we're going to turn now to chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners and against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I would argue these three verses are the thesis of the entire book. If you look throughout the entire book and you were looking, where, where can I find a succinct summary of what the entire book is about? I think it's right here. Because first, it connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. The, the, the heroes of the Old Testament are the ones that are the cloud of witnesses standing around God's kingdom and cheering them on because they are a part of that legacy too. But furthermore, the purpose of the book is exactly what's being talked about in these verses. This is written so that you will continue the race, that you are going to continue down the path that you have started on that you will be able to run it with endurance and not be tangled up or tripped over by the sins that are surrounding you. That's really the message of the whole book, is to keep the course. Keep on the right path. 
And the racing metaphor is something that's very common in Paul's writings. We see it in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. We see it in Philippians 1, 30. We see it in 1 Timothy 6, 12. We see it in 2 Timothy 4, 7, uh, which to me is an indication that this book is either written by Paul or somebody that is familiar with Paul's teaching and, and probably a protege of Paul, possibly Luke, possibly Timothy. Again, I told you before, I think it's Paul. Uh, but this is a common metaphor that he uses over and over again, so it's one of his, his pet metaphors that he'll use. But it is to illustrate this idea that the Christian walk is a marathon, not a sprint, and it's going to be difficult, and things are going to come up at this point that you aren't expecting, that you have to deal with. You're going to hit personal limitations. You're going to hit limitations that surround you, obstacles, that kind of thing. But ultimately, it is a race, and we are called to finish. And we are provided with what we need to finish as well. The Old Testament heroes are the witnesses that are sort of cheering them on. In fact, the Greek word used here could be translated spectators. I think witnesses is a better translation because it speaks more to what is being espoused here. But if you go along with the running metaphor, the idea of the cloud of witnesses, the heroes of the Old Testament being spectators of this whole thing and cheering on the Christians so that God's kingdom will continue, that's one that's pretty powerful. Uh, the, uh, the Greek word for obstacle that we see that's used in verse 1, talking about obstacle and sin which entangles us, the Greek word there is onkos, which means excessive weight. And there's a couple different ways to understand this. First, you could see it as excessive weight. In other words, a burden that a runner is carrying that they do not need. So you could think of it like training weights. If you've ever done any kind of weight training with running, you know, having weights on your wrist or having weights on your ankles, the idea of you don't need that, go ahead and take that off. So this is something that we also see that could be associated with the idea of heavy burdens that Jesus talks about in Matthew 23, 4, where it talks about the old law being a heavy burden around your neck. Uh, and it's something that is no longer necessary. All these extra laws that the Pharisees were coming up with. And so one of the things that may be sort of espoused here is that the Hebrew author is telling them to get rid of those extra weights, those things that are weighing you down and keeping you from running the race that you need to be able to run. Uh, and it could also mean it could be understood that it's getting rid of your bodily extra weight. In other words, this idea that after time and practice, um, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody that actually starts running, usually their body looks a little bit heavier when they start than when they've been doing it for a little while. And so it's the same kind of idea here that through practice and through running the race that that excess weight will be shed and will be better at running this Christian race that we're called to run. Uh, another Greek word that I want to look at here real quickly in verse 2, the Greek word for originator, you may have in your Bible, for example, the King James translates that as author. The word that's used there is archagos, which means an author or a pioneer. And so there's a parallelism here that is being talked about where we just saw how Abraham is talked about as the pioneer. He's this exile that goes out as the originator of the faith. Well, Jesus is the originator of our faith. Just like Abraham is the one that started the monotheistic Yahwehism, which is what the, the scholarly name for worshiping the one true God would be. Jesus is the founder and originator of our faith. He is the one that establishes the faith that we follow and worship him. And so this idea that Jesus is a forerunner also works very well with this metaphor that is being given of running the race. Not only are we running a path that God called us to like Abraham did, but we have an advantage that Abraham never had, which is we have an example. We have a forerunner. We have somebody that shows us how the race is supposed to run. And all we have to do is follow the same path that he did in order to finish the race. If we follow him, we wind up in the same place that he did. Uh, and so that's something that's very vivid here as well. Um, also, I think it's important to note here where it talks about Jesus did not seek out the shame, but endured it with joy. And so that's something that's very important. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. There was shame that was associated with it. And yet 
Despite that, somehow joy is involved, which seems to not really make sense. But I think I can illustrate that pretty well. We just recently had Mother's Day a couple weeks ago. Uh, I know that there's a lot of moms out there in the audience right now. By show of hands, how many of you mothers really enjoyed labor? No takers. How many of you were willing to endure that labor with joy because it meant you got to have children? Okay, see, now we got some hands going up. So it's the same kind of thing. Jesus did not want to endure the shame of the cross. It was not something he was looking forward to. Anybody that's read the passages on the Garden of Gethsemane understand this. And yet it was a thing that he was willing to endure because it meant he got to be with his people. And so it's the same kind of thing. And really, that's what verse 3 is saying. This was the point all along. Jesus endured something far greater, a far greater obstacle than we ever will have to. And if he endured, and he is our he is our forerunner, he is our example, then we can endure too. And that's really where he's getting at. Uh, We'll look at verses four through eight. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are punished by him. For whom the Lord loves, uh, for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he punishes every son whom he accepts. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So we look at this idea of what does he mean by not having resisted to the point of shedding blood. Uh, Very quickly, I'll give this analogy. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie Rudy. This is a story about a football player, a little bitty guy, not really suited to play football. He was only a decent high school football player, but loves Notre Dame football, really wants to play for Notre Dame. And eventually winds up, I know I'm giving a spoiler, this movie's like 30 years old, I think I'm okay. Uh, He winds up making the team, he's on the team, and the reason that he's on the team is because he plays harder than anybody else on the field. And I remember at one point, one of the players was complaining to Rudy, he's saying, dude, you have to do this every single day, you're making us look bad. Because if I hear one more coach say, why can't you play as hard as Rudiger, I'm going to throw up. And so it's the same idea that we're kind of seeing here. He's saying what you have endured so far is not even to the point of shedding blood. You have not even endured the kind of perseverance to the severity that you should have had to. And you're already thinking that it's time to throw in the towel. And that's something that is simply not acceptable. Uh, Real quickly, we'll mention too that uh, the quotation in verse 5 and 6, that's from Proverbs 11 and 12. And... I think it speaks to, that proverb does, the idea that pain is not a sign that God disapproves, but rather that God loves. That just like I'm sure as we talked about just a second ago, the parents in the audience understand that sometimes a parent will allow a child to undergo pain in order to allow them to grow. And that's something that uh, is being espoused here in Hebrews 12. He's saying, don't think of your pain as an indication that God is not pleased with you. In fact, it proves that you are the true heirs of the people of God. You are actually the heir that is going to inherit the kingdom. Because if you were not enduring that, that would mean you were an illegitimate child. The fact that you are enduring this pain and discipline is proof that God cares about you. So that's where we'll leave it. We'll pick up on verse 9 next Wednesday, and we'll finish up the class. Thank you. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.